Well, my name is Keith Collins. I'm one of the pastors here at Lakeview. And on behalf of the whole church family here, welcome. Thank you for being with us for this Easter celebration. Happy Easter to you. I hope you have a wonderful time today after you're with us this morning, enjoying some time with your family, we hope. Uh, this is my first Easter with one of my children missing. Shout out to Grace. Grace, I know you're watching. We miss you. Uh, who's away this first time family member out at college. Um, Easter. Right, I've titled this kind of a strange title, you might think, the, the Resurrection and the Conveyor Belt Life. Because it's Easter again, right? And listening to Chris tell his story from last year, wasn't Easter just like a couple of months ago? Did we just do this? Doesn't everything in life feel like we just did this and then here we are again? And I, I feel this way. I imagine you feel this way as well. I haven't always felt this way in my life, but I have felt this way the last 10 years or so, that life is like this, this conveyor belt that just keeps coming and, and it keeps coming at a pace that, that no one can keep up with. And so just the thought this morning that here, another Easter is here. I feel like, man, how did this get here so fast again? Who keeps speeding this belt up? Now, if you're old enough, that reminds you of a scene, a classic scene in Hollywood, right? This scene from I Love Lucy. <laughs> so. So this is what comes to mind for me this, this, this week. I'm thinking, this is what life feels like. It just, it just keeps coming, right? There's stuff coming down the conveyor belt, and it, I, it's coming too fast, right? You got, you got people coming down your conveyor belt, right? You've got your kids, you've got your spouse, you've got your extended family. There's stuff going on with your relatives, your in-laws. Some are going to be with you today. That's going to be interesting for some of you. Uh, they're coming, right? And, and then... They've got a storyline, they've got needs going on, they've got a plot that you're trying to keep up with and interact with. There, there's just the routines of life that are coming down. Right? You get up in the morning, you gotta figure out, I gotta go to the gym, I've got, I've got morning commute to take care of, and, and then who's gonna do the laundry, and there's meal prep, and there's meal time, and, and oh yeah, tonight the kids have a game, I've gotta figure out a way to get to that. Uh, and, and, and then there's the whole cyber world that you know, 10 years ago didn't come down the conveyor belt. But it does now, right? I mean, there's Facebook. Are you guys keeping up? I mean, today, Facebook, you're going to be behind. You're sitting in church today. That's just stuff is rolling in right now on your Facebook <laughs> that you're going to have to find time to go look at. And Instagram and is coming. And there's a blog post on your favorite hobby, posted a blog post. And if you have news feeds, oh my gosh, you're going to fall so far behind by being here this morning. The news feed from CNN and whoever you subscribe to. I, I do have to say this. I, I love when my phone pings me with a news feed, right? You, you get this, this ping goes off and volcano erupts, kills hundreds on the side of the world. It's like, other side of the world. Uh, okay, and then right after that, the ESPN app goes off, right? Uh, <laughs> it's crucial game at the end of the two-minute warning, Cal Poly versus Virginia Tech. It's like, did I really need to know that? I don't even know who these schools are, but it's a crucial game right now. Some guy just slam dunked in some guy's face. Oh, thank you, but there's a hundred people who died on a volcano. I, do, I don't need to know all this, but it just keeps coming, right? And then life is just going to happen along the way, right? Maybe you had conflicts this week and you're troubled by those conflicts, Maybe your emotions aren't exactly where you wish they were. You know, you were really excited and happy last week, but you feel flat this week. You have some health concerns. You're wondering, why do I feel so out of it? Why am I moving so slow? What's, what's wrong with me, right? So this is all the conveyor belt stuff. It just, it just keeps coming. And then down the conveyor belt comes Easter. Well, who's got time to interact with Easter? I mean, there's more stuff coming. I, I've just been grasping and dealing and say, this is the great danger. I wish I could preach a message in this direction, but this is the great danger of the conveyor belt life. Is it, it's going to do this to us. It's going to take significant things in our lives and we're going to treat them insignificantly. You probably notice this. It's probably relationships in your life that are being treated insignificantly. Because I, I just don't have time to, I don't have the mental energy to interact with all this stuff. Well, here comes Easter. 
Can I just say that Easter is a massive, massive event. What took place at Easter is like nothing else that has ever happened in the history of humanity. This is a news flash that never gets old. It never becomes less important. All right, now listen, if, you, if you're new to the planet here, um, let me just give you, here, here's Easter. Luke chapter 24 is, is the Easter event. And, and this passage is going to be read from in churches all over the world this morning and going to be preached from. However, I'm not going to preach from this passage. I'm just going to introduce this event to us. There was an event that took place 2,000 years ago. And when the kids sang about it today, Eric shared some thoughts about it. There was this tomb into which a dead person was laying. And three days later, life had invaded that same space. And something unknown previously or since then to man took place. Somebody beat death. Death for everybody else has been the last word, but not on this morning, right? Here's a... Here's the quick resurrection story. Luke 24. On the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. Right? So these angels appear at the tomb. And as they were Frightened and they bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Right? That, those, those, that statement right there is so critical to understanding the Christian faith. This is the Christian faith. It is believing in the person and the activity of Jesus Christ that specifically involve those details. Jesus Christ would be crucified on Friday, on Good Friday, we remember that. He would be dead, clearly. He would be put in a tomb, but in three days he would do something that nobody could explain in the natural. He would throw off death and rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. That was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. It's an interesting presentation of this story that's changed the world. Jesus Christ. And this is how it initially, those who were very following him, Face the challenge of believing that something so enormous, death, could be overcome. Listen, this is, this is the great event of Easter. But what I want to do for us today is I don't just want to rehearse or go back to the event. I want to talk about why is this relevant to you and to me today? Why does this matter in everyday spaces of our lives when you and I are fighting the conveyor belt of life? Why does it matter right there? Right? And to do that, I'm going to ask you to turn to Hebrews, or you can look at these passages on the screen with me. I'm going to be in Hebrews chapter 2 in particular, and this is going to help us really understand and see Easter, but, but I wanted to hear leading up to Easter what God writes in his word beginning in Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews is written in the first century, so maybe some 25, 30 years after the resurrection has occurred, this is going to be written down trying to explain the significance of what we have observed in the Easter story. So listen what to this charge, because we need to be charged this way. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 says, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophet, right? God spoke. Don't, don't miss this. There is a God who feels like he has spoken some things to us. We may all feel like he is distant from us. We question whether sometimes God really loves us, whether he's near and he knows what's going on. But listen, from God's vantage point, God says this, long ago and in many ways, I spoke. 
I made myself known to you. You could pick this up at any time and, and read it, right? I know some, listen, get serious here, right? There's some of us who walk around indicting God. We bring him up on charges. We challenge, does he really love us? Does he care? Look at the difficulties in my life. And, and, and God would, would be able to say, hey, have you ever read anything about me? I mean, it was a chunk of my life. Frank was describing his life. A chunk of my life growing up, I never read anything about God. This has been in existence my whole life. I never picked it up and read it. God says, I spoke. I revealed some things that are worth knowing. But then he says this here. He spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So he has spoken to us by his son. So Easter morning is God speaking. Jesus Christ is revealing. He's answering questions. He's helping us understand the very nature of life itself. So listen, Easter is screaming at God. I know it's coming down the conveyor belt. I know it's crowded out by a lot of other things, but it's, it's saying something to us. You fast forward a little bit in Hebrews chapter 2, and it says this, verse 1. Therefore, right, if God is speaking, therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift from it. And in verse 3 it says, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great Salvation, that's a big word, right? Don't, don't race past it. You're reading the Bible and the Bible uses a word that says salvation. The Bible describes something is being saved here. If you read past that, you don't even, none of us can get what the Bible's even about. It's a book about a story of salvation. And this passage screams out at us that we must not neglect this great salvation. It was declared at first by the Lord It was attested to us by those who heard, right? Eyewitnesses. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. God God did fireworks type displays of his power through Jesus Christ and through the apostles after him to do miraculous things, to draw attention to this message. But I find it interesting that the Bible's turning around and saying, hey, make sure you pay careful attention to this. Now, what's challenging in this is this is written to people who lived in the first century. No cell phones, no news feeds, no blogs, no Facebook. They, they lived a rather simple life compared to the noisy, distracted, full lives that we lead. I, I mean, I don't know. They must have sat with the conveyor belt coming going... I know something will be here soon. <laughs> Boy, today is boring. And, and those guys needed to hear God said, hey, don't overlook this. Pay careful attention to it. So can you imagine how much help we need for the Bible to reach out and grab us by the shoulders and say, listen up. Pay careful attention in the midst of all your noise. And, and I know right now some of you are concerned whether something at home is burning what time are people supposed to get to my house for lunch today? Right, every, this, uh, pay careful attention. Easter is the biggest event that ever happened. It's the most important thing that ever happened in any of our lives. And then a little bit farther down, here's our explanation for Easter today. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 says, But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. And then in verse 14, it says, Since therefore the children, like you and I, share in flesh and blood, right? We're walking around in these bodies. He himself likewise partook of the same things. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to life-long slavery. Right, now th- this, 
This verse is massively helpful, right? It's staring back at Easter and it's saying, hey, I just, I just want to make sure you see two things here, right? This verse calls us to see two things in particular. And if you see these two things, suddenly Easter will come to life, right? Here's the two things I just want us to see in this passage. One is I want us to see Jesus and I want us to see death. Because those two things are all about the resurrection, right? So let, let's, let's see Jesus first. In verse 9, it says, we see him, namely Jesus. Well, how do we see him? Well, we see him crowned with glory and honor, right? So right now, right, here's the reality of our lives. There is a physical dimension, we're, right? We're clothed in flesh and blood. There is an unseen spiritual dimension of our lives. The Bible clearly teaches that, and you and I feel that as we move through life. We sense these things. We experience this spiritual dimension. So if we could pull back the veil between the physical and the spiritual, and we could right now, right now at this instant, see into heaven, we would see Jesus Christ crowned with glory and honor. He would be seated on a throne radiant light would be coming from him. There'd be a sense of power and awe and almost intimidation and amazement at the God who is seated on that throne. Jesus Christ is seated on that throne. Listen, I, I don't, not every world religion teaches this. This is why it pays to pay attention. There'd be a lot of world religions that would just say Jesus Christ was just another man. He had a message. But, but the Bible would say, if we see Jesus, if we really see Jesus, he is seated on a throne. He's reigning over the universe. And he is crowned and he is being honored in a unique way. That's if we see Jesus. But if 2,000 years ago we could go back in time and see Jesus, you would not see him that way. You would see him dressed in the same outfit that these children were dressed in, flesh and blood. He'd be walking around on earth. He'd have dusty feet. He'd be wearing something that looks like he just bought it at a garage sale. And then there'd become a particular day in human history marked by inside the Bible and outside the Bible history that he was nailed to a cross. And he died on that cross. And he was buried in a tomb. And three days later, he came back to life. He would have been in a body and he'd have looked just like a guy in your neighborhood walking around the streets of earth. And the question, right, we see Jesus. All right, right now, if I say, what do, you, what, do you, what do you see when you see Jesus? What comes to mind for you when you think about this person, Jesus Christ? What do, you, what do you see? Well, this verse is loaded with some stuff to see. Right, this verse is going to introduce us to somebody that I'm going to call strategic Jesus. It's going to let us see strategic Jesus. Now, strategic Jesus, I'll get back to him in just a second, but he's different than what we might see, what some people see. Right, some people, when they look at Jesus Christ, they see hippie Jesus. Y'all know hippie Jesus? I mean, he's just, he's chill, you know. He's got long hair, for sure. <laughs> Doesn't look like he's shaved in quite a while. Probably rides a Harley. <laughs> Hangs with some, you know, some cool dudes. And the thing about hippie Jesus is he just kind of, you know, he's kind of like listened to a lot of the Doobie Brothers. Um, you know, Jesus is just all right. He's just all right, you know. He's just fun to be with. We're hanging. We're doing life together. You know, probably the peeps he's hanging out with are smoking something. Maybe you think he's smoking something. Because Jesus is chill. He's hippie Jesus. Now, for a bunch of us in here, we're not into hippie Jesus. Some of y'all didn't live through that era of our 60s and 70s experience. But most of us are into ultimate example Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate example. Just put anything on the table, he's the ultimate example of it. He's the exalt, ultimate example of attitudes and how to treat people. He's a specialist in that, how to treat people. Right, he's the ultimate example. And so you're left with this idea, let, let me see Jesus. Okay, well, well, what are you looking at? I'm looking at this guy who is the ultimate example of what everybody should aspire to be. He's, he's just a source of inspiration. Really? Okay. Like, like Gandhi? 
uh, Mother Teresa, Michael Jordan. Those two people, first of all, you didn't know who they were, did you? But Michael Jordan, everybody knows. All right, these guys are inspirational figures. But, but here's the challenge with Jesus or anybody just being an, an inspirational figure. They may not be relevant to you at all because you may not be wanting to be inspired in whatever it was that they were really good at. Right? Gandhi. Some of us right now are going, yeah, yeah. What did Gandhi do again? I, I think I've heard of him. You know, if you're not into religious social reform, maybe you don't pay attention to Gandhi. So you just kind of dismiss him. Mother Teresa. Well, everybody wants to have compassion for other people, but I'm not sure I want to do it at that level, you know? I'm not sure I see myself living in Calcutta, going through the difficulties of life. So, you know, I can kind of dismiss her as well. You know, I was a great basketball player growing up, so Michael Jordan catches my attention. He's inspirational. I want to be like Mike. But you're sitting here going, I could give a rip about basketball. So you just dismissed him, right? I don't know what's wrong with you, but there is something wrong with you, by the way. <laughs> but you just dismiss Michael. He's just not an inspirational figure. So here, along comes Jesus. And if he's just ultimate Jesus, ultimate, you know, inspiring figure Jesus. But maybe you don't kind of want to be like him in the moment. You're in a bad mood. I don't want to be like him right now. So I can dismiss him. But, but what if he's not... Hippie Jesus or ultimate example Jesus? What if he's strategic Jesus? And this verse makes it sound like he is. What if Jesus Christ came to earth under a strategy? There was a reason why he was here. And that's what's in this verse, right? You see in verse nine there? It says, for a little while, he was made lower than the angels, right? This is just peeling back the reality of the, world that we live in. So there's this God level where God exists and then there's created order. There's angels who exist underneath that. And then beneath those angels, there's human beings. And this verse tells us something. Jesus Christ for a little while became lower. He hopped a level. He didn't, he didn't become an angel. Why not become an angel? Well, not part of the strategy. But he became a man. What was that all about? Why would that happen? Why is this inspirational figure becoming a human being? And only for a little while? For a little while he was made. Right? This stuff gives away curious points. Why, why is this happening? Here's why. So that he might taste death. Why did Jesus Christ put on a flesh and blood body come to earth, hop down below the angels, live amongst humanity. Why did he do that? To teach us some things? Well, yeah, because he did do that. To inspire us to be better, the ultimate version of ourselves that we could ever be? Well, you know, well, maybe that touches you that way. But this is why. Here's the strategy. He came to taste death. He came to die. Jesus Christ came into this world to die. That was his destiny. So what happened here on Good Friday, I don't know if it feels like, you know, something went bad here. All right, you get to Good Friday and oops, somebody major fumbled here. This is son of God and oh my gosh, they're going to kill him. Listen, this is totally God's doing. They're doing exactly what God had planned to take place. There was a strategy here. If you read your Bible carefully, you'll, you'll pick up on this strategy. Um, did you know God was so intent on making sure his son died that he blinded the eyes of people so that they wouldn't figure out who he was? That sounds kind of weird, right? Lest they don't, no, hey, don't kill him. He really is the son of God. Don't kill him. That's, that would have been their response. And so the Bible says God smeared their eyes because the mission Jesus Christ was on was a strategic mission. He came to die and not just die death but listen to this to taste death for everyone everyone you me every person he came to taste death for everyone so so unlike mother Teresa or Michael Jordan who may not hold interest to us what Jesus did is relevant to every one of us for an obvious reason 
Because this other thing we need to see is relevant to every one of us. It's this thing called death. Death is relevant to every last one of us. And what Jesus does in the resurrection is really what he did with his life as well. See, sometimes Jesus is just famous for things that he taught, things that he said. But here's what Jesus did from the moment he shows up in public, right? You might remember the first thing he does is he goes to a wedding feast and they run out of wine. Right? Remember this story? The wedding feast at Cana. And somebody's about to be really, really embarrassed and they come running to Jesus. Oh, Jesus, can you help out here? And Jesus takes giant buckets of water and turns them into the best wine these people have ever had in their lives. Well, what's he doing right there? Well, it's almost as though he shows up on planet Earth like he's got this secret key to everything. That he can unlock everything with this key. And so, yeah, bring me the water. It's wine now. Uh, what'd you just do? And then they'll bring sick people to him. With all their trouble and all their broken bodies. And, and Jesus just bring, bring them here. And it's like he takes out a key and he goes, he unlocks something and now they're healed. Wait, what did you just do? He brings people that were demonized and had spiritual forces that were oppressing their lives. They were losing their minds. Jesus takes this key out. Just turns it and their whole world changes. And when Jesus gets to this grave as a human being, he's dead. And he takes the key out and he unlocks death and he comes out with the resurrection. See what Jesus Christ did throughout his life. If, if you miss this, Jesus is just a teacher. Jesus Christ demonstrated that he's got the key to everything. He's got authority over everything. You know why that is? Because the Bible says he's the one who created everything. He is the creator. That's why he sits on the throne of heaven because he's got the rights to sit there. So when you see Jesus, what, what are you seeing? You're, you're seeing this person who is God himself, who has the power over everything, including death. That's relevant. To you and me because death is having a conversation with us throughout our lives. All right, I want to point out two things about death before I finish. Death is going to be two things to every one of us. And the Bible presents it this way. It's going to be an event. That event's going to come once. And you're not coming back from it. But it's also going to be a shadow it's going to exist in two forms. And that shadow is going to show up every day of your life. All right? So get that. Get an event and you've got this shadow dimension. Let me talk about the event real quickly. At some point, right, all of us know this, nobody's getting out of this alive. Does everybody know that? I'm looking around. Some of you are closer to the exit door than others. <laughs> All right, well, here's, this is a sobering reality, right? Because I know that, you know, death is on the conveyor belt as well, isn't it? Right, when, I, when I look away from the conveyor belt and I'm busy doing my little stuff, sometimes I look up and it's like, that's a lot closer than it was <laughs> last time I looked. Right, and that's, this is that effect that death brings into our lives. But there's a sobering reality to death because in, in some way, if you, if you try and glance behind death on the conveyor belt, it's, it's weird. It's not like any other point on the conveyor belt because there's nothing behind it. And so that makes death this strange thing in our lives, this final thing in our lives. All right, so I'm, I'm going to read from Psalm 103. I, I want you to feel what... This event feels like when the Bible describes it to us. And I want you to catch the surrounding words that the psalmist puts here. Psalm 103 verse 11, it says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. Right? So God is wanting, listen, even into this conversation about death, God is injecting his love for us. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. And do you think about your life that way? Dust is just this fragile stuff that we're made of. 
Have, have you gotten in touch with that reality that, that you're made of fragile stuff? That you're just not going to go on forever? That what you're made of has got an expiration date on it. It won't keep going. Verse 15, as for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it's gone. And its place knows it no more. I've shared this with the church through the years. That, that verse came to life for me. And these things come to life for us in different moments. It came to life for me when my dad died. Had lived 96 years, was just a, a, a wonderful figure in my life and my heart. And I read that verse and it, I, my, the pit of my stomach felt like it just fell out. I, just, I felt the valley that this flower had bloomed in. And I thought, so that's it. 96 years. Investing his life, relationships, building things, doing things, having jobs, being responsible, living the life. And now when the wind passes over the place that he was, this place doesn't even know him anymore. Right? For me, he was a champion. He was a heroic figure. He was huge in my heart. Now he's just like dust. He's just gone. And the spaces that he lived in, the highways that he drove on, the neighborhood that he lived in, the house that he lived in, none of those things know him anymore. You know, this is death. The place that you and I live in, that conveyor belt life that we're living, where we're just grabbing it, trying to have everything under the sun, trying to have everything just right, freaking out, building our lives a certain way, relating to people, freaking out because we can't relate to the right people. We can't have the right things. We can't have the ultimate things. Do, do you realize all of that at some moment is going to be a place where the wind is going to blow across the places of your life and nothing's going to know you anymore? God says, I, I know your frame. I know what you're made of. I'm the one who said that life is a vapor. Right? It's still cold enough at night you can go out and get a glimpse of this. Just go breathe and see how fast it takes for that to be gone. You see it for a moment and it's gone. That's death. Listen, if you and I are building stuff with our conveyor belt lifestyle, that death is going to take it all away and it'll be nothing. Oh, what a mistake we are making. And God in his conversation about death in verse 17 of the psalm says, but, but the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. It never goes away. You never lose it. It's ever with you. It's the most important thing that ever gets connected to your life. And death can't take that. Well, there is this thing called death as an event, but there's this other dimension of death and it's the shadow of death, right? This object coming on our conveyor belt, is, it's pretty big and it's traveling and it's so big that it casts a shadow on all of our lives, right? That's what this verse says. People were living in a lifelong slavery to the fear of death, lifelong, right? Death is only gonna come for you once. But there's something about it that it haunts us. It reminds us. It interacts with our lives. It messes with us. Because even though I might be busy doing the conveyor, I notice it's, got, it's a little darker. It's a little shady. What, what's that? And you look up and it's death. It's the shade, the shadow of death. And the Bible describes it. Remember the famous Psalm 23. If you don't know any other Psalms, you know that one. It says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will not fear, though, because you are with me. See, everything is about God and his ability to rescue us out of this death. But when you look at death, death in the Bible, it's this everyday shadow due to a everyday disconnect. Right, so there's a dimension of death that is more than just an event that's coming that will claim your physical life. 
There's a disconnect. That shadow is a disconnect, right? Now, here's how the Bible describes death. This is the last thought I want to give to you. In the Garden of Eden, God explained how to walk with him, how to trust him and relate to him. And he said one thing that was out of bounds in that garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's when God explains that tree is when we get introduced to this thing called death. We don't have any awareness of it before then. He tells Adam and Eve, do not eat from that tree. For the day that you eat from this tree, you will surely die. That's the same word in the Hebrew that gets used throughout the Old Testament 690 something times. So God introduces this thing called death. But, but if you follow the storyline, you know this, right? They ate of the tree. And neither one of them dropped dead. They, they kept on living. But what God said was true. He said, the day you eat of this, you will die. So even though they look alive... God now says, no, no, you have now entered into the realm of death. Death is in you and it will travel with you every day of your life, even though you are alive in some way. So here's how the Bible describes this death. I'm going to throw a few verses at you real quick. In the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 2, chapter 2 says this, and you were dead, right? The apostle Paul writing to Christians who are following God. And he describes their past this way. He says, you were dead. That's what you were, dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who's now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, And we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. All of mankind was in this condition. Dead. Yet, there's a lot of action verbs that come after this, right? You were dead, but you were following the course of this world. Right? You're still checking Facebook every day. You're still going to the ball game with your kids, climbing the backstop, yelling at the ump. Right? You, I mean, you still got life going on. You're, you're still planning an unaffordable Disney vacation. You're, you're dead though, but you're still doing all these things. Just very, very busy. Living, right, wait, so we were dead, but then the verse goes on and says, living in the passions of their flesh. So did you know that dead people in this dimension of death can have desires in their heart, can have passions in their flesh? There's things that they want to see carried out. There's dreams that they want to have. They want to eat good food, and they do. They go to Jazz Fest. They they start a new business. They buy a new car. They travel. Did you know dead people do all this stuff? But they're still dead. In, In one aspect of our lives, we are in this condition that the Bible calls dead. So you may not feel like you're dead, but the Bible says you're dead. It's the death that got introduced in the Garden of Eden. It's not the event coming down the conveyor belt that's going to show up and take your physical life. It's a condition that's already in you. It's shadowy. All right, so here's what Ephesians goes on and says, though, a few verses later, right? Verse 1 says, you were dead, but, verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy, just overflowing from the inside out, because of the great love with which he loved us. Remember that psalm? The steadfast love of the Lord, it just never ceases. It never ceases. Well, because of that love, even when, verse 5, we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. And he raised us up with him, right? Now we're we're showing up at Easter, right? This is the resurrection. He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See, you and I are, are living lives under a condition that the Bible describes as dead. Something's not right. 
something, sometimes it feels like it's dead and it stinks on the inside, right? Have you gotten to that place sometimes in life? But it's pretty common to feel like I'm in a place where it just feels like something's missing. Something's, something's not right in me right now. And we're trying to figure out what that is, but the Bible explains what that is. It's this condition on the inside of us is dead. We have become separated from the life of God. That's what's missing in this moment. Well, is there a fix for this? Yeah, we just read about it. God can make us alive out of mercy in his heart for us. One more passage. 1 Peter chapter 1. The apostle Peter describes it this way in verse 3. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy. Why does God do this? Why does God send his son dressed in human flesh? Why for a little while does he become lower than the angels? Why is there a strategy from God to rescue dead people and make them alive? Why does God do that? Does he just look out at humanity and say, okay, let me see who's on their best behavior. Who's sticking out? Who's putting up real effort here? Oh, you and you. Not you for sure, but you, yeah, you, that's right. I know you didn't think I'd pick you, but I did. And, and is this like God's surveying the land? Because, you know, this Bible keeps using the word mercy. Mercy. Why does God do this? Because in his heart is a love ingested with mercy. And he pours it out on our lives. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. And that makes sense, right? Because if I died on the inside, I might need to be born on the inside. And I've already been born once on the outside. So this is why the Bible uses that term, born again to a living hope. Where's that hope from? Come through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. All right, wow. This is Easter, right? This is Easter being relevant. This is not Easter, I have some bunnies and we're going to eat today. And I'm going, okay, thanks Keith, you about done because the conveyor belt is keeping moving for me. Can we keep it moving too? Okay, I just need to stop and say, do we see this? Have you seen this Jesus, strategic Jesus, who came for a reason to enter into our death? This was just the great strategy of God was to climb into death and then blow it up from the inside out. This sounds like a Marvel movie, right? That's where Marvel movies get their ideas from, by the way. God is going to come into, he said he came in order to taste death. It was Jesus saying, give me a giant dose of that. And he enters into death. And when he gets inside of it for three days, he comes back out and conquers it and destroys it. And then God turns around and says, I want to, I want to give this to you. Right? You will get this to an inheritance. You get born again to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation. There's that word again. Listen, the Bible says, don't neglect this great salvation. Here's that word again. It's a salvation. There is a saving of us. There's a rescue of us that God was doing. The strategy was about saving us from the death on the inside of us and the eventual death we will face. In this, verse 6 says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. Right? That was, that was Chris's story. Right? Last year at Easter, he encountered God in a way that, that made him eyes wide open. God You've got a purpose and a plan for me. And God got a hold of his attention. God took Easter morning. I hope this is happening for some here. God grabbed Chris Easter morning and said, hey, pay careful attention. And God began to explain himself to Chris. Now, if you follow Chris's story throughout the year, it didn't mean everything in life got worked out and there was no more any difficulties. This has been a breeze of a year. This has not been a breeze of a year for him. 
But yet if you get around this man for a few minutes, you will see verse 6 come to life. A person who is rejoicing even in the midst of trials and difficulty. Why? Because I have life. And I have eternal life. And I have a hope that can never be taken away from me. Listen, this is... This is why there is Easter. This is why we can't afford just to get caught up in whatever's coming down the conveyor belt next. We just are all lost in it. And then Easter just, there it goes. On to the next thing. Here comes May, summer. Easter is revealing something that is massively, massively important. That term death gets used in just this little three passages we just read from Hebrews. Five times. Five times it's spoken of, both as an event and as a shadow. And and, and maybe you're here this morning. You haven't used the word death, shadow, inside death. You haven't used any of those words, but you have been walking around asking the question, why does my life feel the way it does? Wow, why do I feel this way? Why does... Why does life feel like it's felt lately? Empty? Like you're just missing something? I relate to that. I mean, I was a teenager and that, that's, that's how God got my attention. Just life just felt like it was just missing something. Listen, it wasn't that all the other things were wrong. I hope you don't hear me saying that. You know, God's got a lot of things for us to enjoy in life. There's a lot coming down the conveyor belt that we should enjoy. God gives this to us. They're not all bad. I'm not telling you empty your conveyor belt except anything but Easter. I'm not saying that. But all along the way, we can have so many things and be traveling through life and just feel like something's not right. Something's just missing. It's what the resurrection was coming to give us. Life, a second life, to be born again from the inside out, to give to us what we didn't have before. Listen, maybe, maybe you're living in what this passage described as, as, as having some severe bouts with fear. The Bible actually says you can live in lifelong slavery to the fear of death. Right? Some of us are living in that. And you don't have to just be an old person living in that. You be a young person living with this sense of death is imminent and it's, it's, it's coming. And I live in fear of that. All right, well, this morning, this Easter, 2019, well, what do you do about that? Do you understand God had a strategy to do something with that? In his great love and in his great mercy, he was not okay that you and I would live our lives feeling like we're missing something. We're dead on the inside. He took action. He had a strategy. Which here's my question to you that I want you to answer before you leave here today. What are you going to do with strategic Jesus? Not teacher Jesus, inspirational Jesus, hippie Jesus, or some other Jesus, but strategic Jesus, the Jesus who came to do what this verse describes became lower than angels, came as a man, died a death, in our place, taking our blame, removing our sin, and then came up out of death with a resurrected life to give it to whosoever will receive it. What are you gonna do with strategic Jesus? See, you can dismiss the other Jesuses, can't you? But you can't dismiss strategic Jesus. He's, he's got a purpose. Now here, here's what I, I offer you what the Bible offers you. In John chapter 1, Gospel of John introduces this Jesus and says this. He came to his own, to his own people. But his own people did not receive him. Right? They rejected Jesus. That's, that's why he goes to the cross. But, but. To as many as did receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. 
those who were not born of man or of the will of man, but who were born of the Spirit. That's that born again. To as many as did receive him, he gives the right to become something that just five minutes ago you were not. To become a child of God and dwelt by God with that inner condition no longer haunting you. It's fixed. The life of God is now come. There's now rejoicing. There's hope born inside of our soul. I got no Easter eggs for you this morning. Got no candy for you this morning. Got an incredible offer for you this morning. It's not my offer. It's the offer of scripture that God makes. Would you like to receive strategic Jesus? Would, would, would you like to have him come and bring life where once it felt like something was missing? Something was broken on the inside? Think about it. That's Chris's story, right? Sat at Easter, heard something that said, oh, wow. I need to think about this. And maybe you just need to think about it this morning. But at some point, if you really want to experience what Chris described and what the Bible describes here, you're going to need to receive it. You're going to need to actually turn your face to Jesus Christ and say yes to him. And open your heart in faith and receive him into your life. All right, so that's the offer God makes to us. What, a, what an awesome Easter basket this is. All right, let's stand up together. I'm going to pray for us. Maybe just would bow your head and, and have a moment, conversation with you and the Lord. Listen, how valuable is this? Because I get it. I know the conveyor belt is piling up. Stuff is coming, which makes this moment so critical. When God says, hey, do I, I've got your attention right now. You, you sat still, you blew off the conveyor belt, and you've just been listening and letting me speak to you. So can, can you just get quiet? Maybe just shut yourself in with the Lord. God is a personal God. He knows everything about you. He knows what's going on in your life right now. He knows what life feels like when death invades it and hope seems lost and things just don't feel right he knows that so he knows where you are right now if that's how you're feeling so to just bow our hearts for a moment and have a conversation with God Lord I thank you that you are so intentional. You are strategic. Lord, the Easter reality is not something that happened because a mistake was made. Your plan got messed up. Jesus came and he got killed. No, you sent your son so that he would taste death for us. The plan went exactly as you had spelled it out. It was your strategy, but Lord, why? Why would you do that? Why design a strategy for the Son of God to come show his power to everyone and then be conquered by death? Lord, it's because you were letting him taste death for everyone. So that when he conquered death, he could give life to everyone who trusted him. And here we are this morning. Or for some here this morning, Lord, they, they certainly have known many of these things. have known much about you. But they walked in here this morning feeling like they're broken on the inside. Something's missing. I'm just not right. My life isn't right. this morning you are here to give life that's what the resurrection was it was you breaking out of death so that we could have life so Lord there are some here this morning who are looking for life and they're here 
maybe that's you right now. Maybe you're in this audience and you want to call on God this morning. And you can. He told you that if you would receive him, you would be born with a new life. You would become his child. God meant that when he said it. So if you want to receive him this morning, turn to him. Which is going to mean turning away from whatever it is you've been doing. Whatever life you've been trusting. Wherever place you've been hoping in. You're going to need to turn from that to him. It's what the Bible calls repenting. Maybe that's where you are right now. And you want to do that. Well, do it. Just say, God, I, whatever it is that I put my hope in, God, this morning I see I, I, it needs to be in you. I, I'm turning away from everything else. Anything that's in your way, God, I surrender that today. And I, I turn to you. Lord, I need life. Would you give me the life that was just described? Would you come live in me? Breathe your life again into me. Come be a part of who I am from this day forward. I want you to be my God. I want you to dwell in my life. This morning, Easter morning 2019, God, I open my life and I receive you into my life. Thank you for coming. And I trust you. And I want to learn of you now. And I'll follow you from this day forward. Or for every person who's here who's praying that prayer right now. Lord, lead them as you did Chris as we hear his story, Lord. Lead them in the paths that are going to bring greater awareness. Greater impact. Rejoicing even when life is difficult. A hope that just cannot be pushed aside. Lord, would you give the greatest gift that's ever been received by any of us, this gift of life and relationship with you, this morning, Easter morning, in Jesus' name, amen.